Hello, don't pay any attention to what you're seeing on screen. We're getting set up for another tutorial night with Hunter, who is on the Discord Balance Through Violence, or Balance Through Yes, I believe, right now. Uh, I'm just playing cameraman. You're not going to hear much from me. This is Hunter's event. I'm just recording it and putting it up on a decently high visibility channel. Let's get rolling. Oh, and this is going to, fair warning, it's going to cut to whenever we actually start. So. This is, oh, uh, specifics. He's doing backline fleets, and I'm going to be fielding questions in the chat. And he's going to be explaining, like, fleet building basics as well as how to use ships. Enjoy. Let me know when you're ready, uh, Dark. We'll probably just start this pretty soon here. Ready now. Okay. Um, so to everyone that's here, welcome back. This is the second iteration of the uh, tutorial series that I was doing. So this time we're going to have a look at um, <clears throat> building backline fleets for both ANS and OSP. Um, disclaimer, this tutorial is going to be done on the test branch currently. And the reason for why I'm doing this is because the game is going to be changing one way or the other. And, uh, the next iteration of the game will be more similar to, well, have more similarities to, um, the test branch than it will to the main branch right now. And as a result of that, I would prefer to have it remain as close to what the game will look like after the update happens for the OSP rebalance. Um, not that it matters particularly for what we're going to be doing today, because a lot of the changes that happen, uh, happened in Test Branch don't really impact Backline that much. So, uh, with that out of the way, we'll get started here with ANS. And since I'm doing this tutorial on both energy weapons and missiles for backline, uh, I'm going to start with energy weapons. Now, ANS energy weapons um, are the railgun and the beam weapon. And of course, the beam cannon is not a long range weapon and therefore not a backline weapon. So we will be using the rail gun here as our test bed. While you can use rail guns on capital ships, they are in a fairly sorry state right now. And uh, there are a few builds that you can do with a rail Axford that are not completely terrible, but um, I'm choosing not to do that because they are not new player friendly. And they, uh, while they're not completely terrible, they still are quite... They're not great, I'll put it that way. And they do require a bit of skill to operate correctly. Uh, and also, they're very limited in their builds. Um, so we're going to be looking at the Rail DD because it is the best example of... Uh, well, pretty much the only example of a decent backline energy weapon for the uh, ANS side right now. Question. Um, yes. What about um, Beam Destroyer Goalies? Beam Destroyer Goalies, I, I guess you're right. In some ways, those are considered backline. Um, I personally consider those to be more along the lines of uh, doing what a cat fleet would be doing or a dad fleet where they're defending rear points uh backline does do this so that is true in a sense but uh we're looking more specifically at a support offensive role than we are going to be looking at uh, beam dds i also covered the way that backline beam dds would work in the previous video um if you watched that too in the ans cat fleet i believe had a goalie beam dd in it where that role was explained it's so, also not very uh, new player friendly. Uh, uh yeah. Well, I'm, they're not too bad, but yes, they do take a little bit of understanding of what you're supposed to be using them for. 
So uh, with that being said, we're going to start here. Um, to begin with, any kind of backline fleet does need tracks in order to operate correctly. It, it You either get those tracks through yourself or you have your teammates providing them to you. If you're building a really greedy build, you're going to be getting all your tracks through your teammates. That's just the way it is. Um, greedy builds often have the highest output for their damage, just like anything else, but uh, they are also a little bit more difficult to run solo or in pubs. So with that in mind, we're going to build a sensor warfare ship first in order to give ourselves tracks if we need to, and our teammates cannot provide them for us. I'm also going to be building these DDs in a way that they are capable of... Um, some level of frontline combat with any kind of opponent they come up to if they have to do it. Uh, for the most part, they will be backline ships, though. So to start there, we're going to put a Pinard Electronic Support System. I'm also going to be running through this quite a bit faster than I did on the first one, so if there are any questions uh, anybody wants to ask, just put them into the text chat, and then someone, like Lone Wolf or Darg, you can uh, just query me and I will try to answer it. Or if you want to answer it yourselves in the text chat, that's fine with me as well. Um, so in this example too, we're going to be using a spyglass uh, and then we're going to be stacking track correlators to it so that we get a very strong signal at maximum range. You'll look over here, the positional error is 22.53. While this isn't amazing and it's not lock quality, it's still pretty good, even at range, especially against larger ships, and you are going to hit with volume of fire eventually. Uh, we're also going to put a bullseye on this, just in case something comes closer to us. With that in mind as well, like I said, I want this fleet to be capable of fighting um, ships that come close to it without with something that's a little more punch and actually can kill things rapidly. Uh, rail guns on ANS do not really kill things particularly fast without gun support. Um, they largely disable things. They do a lot of crits, and so this is one of the this is one of the continuing arguments about how to whether or not they are good, right? Quote unquote, are they a good weapon? Are they useful to bring? And I would argue that they are useful to bring on DDs specifically because they can actually output enough to really cripple your opponent. And if you do have gun support on the ships that are firing them, it, you can kill things very quickly with this. It is, you know, combat rail DDs, as these can be called, are capable of fighting fleets on their own if they can get proper tracks and don't get murdered at very close range. They, they have to be very careful about their range engagements, and they have to make sure the ship that they're shooting with their guns has already been very crippled or disabled by the railguns from a further, safer distance. This sensor ship is also going to have guns on it, just to increase the total firepower. Um, from here, I'm going to try to increase the amount of protection this ship has and uh, DC it has without really going... I don't really want to go over 550 because the rail DDs that are actually going to be doing the damage are going to cost quite a bit of points on top of this. And this ship is purely my sensor ship, right? I don't really... This is probably going to be the most important ship in the fleet, but I do need to be aware of the points I'm going to be spending on my other ships. So from here, I'm going to do the triple stack right here, like I explained in my first video as well. I'm going to put all RDC components on here, just because I want that stacking damage, just in case, or stacking damage reduction, just in case I do actually get hit. Um, you know, you can't prepare for every situation, and sometimes you are going to take damage, so it's best to try to find ways to mitigate it. This is one of them. Uh, so this is almost complete, actually. It's pretty much my sensor ship here. It's got to check my damage, or my rate of fire, so 12 rounds per minute. Um, since 250 comes in 50, or 1 point per 50 units, I, I don't really want to do... You know, this is up to you how you want to decide whether you want to bring 150 rounds or you want to bring 100 rounds. In this example, I will be using 100 and I will bring all three shell types. This is just personal preference. Uh, I think having all shell types is useful. 
even though you are a backline fleet, you know, you're mostly going to be using the rails when I do add those in. So here's our sensor DD. Uh, I'm just going to duplicate it for now, and then I'm going to remove the pinard and put a railgun on it. Now, railgun DDs get really good when you start maxing out E-Regs. This is what really kind of defines this backline fleet. You'll notice here when you put all E-Regs, you get 10 rounds per minute or 10.5 rounds per minute. This is uh, a very high output for a railgun. Um, comparable with something like an Axford, just as an example, I'll just demonstrate the difference between capital railguns and um, DD railguns. So I put all my E-Regs here. Small energy rig. Uh, three railguns with five E-Regs on the, the capital ship is 17.49. This ship isn't even fully loaded out and it's nearly at a K, right? So this is this is comparable cost like this thing's 600 points with just under half and it's this is all going to get changed as well like this well not all of it but some of it's going to change here this is not you know um on a per point basis this is far more efficient in terms of output and this that's the reason why we're using dds for the rail guns instead of a capital ship uh, I don't need, did I remove that? Okay, I can get rid of that. I don't need two CICs. I'm going to get rid of the uh, reinforced CIC for the railgun ships because they are slightly less important than the sensor ship. And the reason the sensor ship is more important than the regular rails is because it's the only ship that can actually see anything for my fleet to begin with. Um, if it dies, then it doesn't really matter if I still have the rail ships if I can't shoot anything. Uh, you're entirely reliant off your teammates after that, so. We are trying to make it a little survivable, though, to be honest. If this thing does get hit, you're pretty much praying. Um, we're going to add the drive. Okay, this is also another point. Uh, on the sensor ship, I'm using a regular drive just for point reduction. I don't need a dragonfly on this thing. Uh, on the rail DDs, I do want a dragonfly because they need to be able to bear to target faster. Censorship doesn't need to really shoot anything directly with its spinal, so it doesn't need to turn fast. Um, yeah, and this is pretty much what a rail DD looks like. <laughs> or combat rail DD, since I'm using 250s on it as well. You can look at my damage output or my rate of fire output. Uh, I'm going to choose to do just over 20 minutes of continuous rail fire that should be enough for one game um i have very rarely run out of ammo playing rail dds like this though it does happen from time to time so you can choose to bring 250 if you want or possibly even 300 if you would really like to do that personally i think 225 is fine so yeah now this rail dd is uh 550 points so we're just going to copy this three, four times and see where we're at. So now we have five DDs in our backline energy fleet, which brings us to 42 rounds per minute of rail fire. And that is not an insignificant amount. That will cripple a Acello in approximately 90 seconds of continuous fire, and that is a very reasonable thing for you to be able to do. Um, same with LNs, they will quickly be incapable of dealing with the number of crits that you are firing on them. The rails are less effective against Acellos than they are against... Uh, uh, rails are less effective against LNs than they are Acellos, sorry. Against lighter ships, such as um, shuttles and tugs, these also do quite well because they typically have less DC teams. And um, a shuttle that's getting hit by 40.2 rounds per minute of rails with a single rapid is going to have a very bad time. Even if they're not really doing a ton of damage to it directly. 
So now we can look at our points. We still have approximately, what is this, 264 points remaining. So a couple of things that are sort of missing from this fleet. One, if we get fired out by missiles, we are going to get, we're going to have a bad time. So I'm going to find a way to uh, increase my protection from missile strikes. I'm going to do two stone walls on each of those DDs. And then I'm going to put... I'm going to put uh, two defenders on my remaining two DDs. Now the output of the stone walls is 512 rounds per minute and it's 75 points per, or one point per 75 units. I'm going to do some quick maths here. Uh, six, 75, so just over one minute of continuous fire time for the flak. And then for the defenders, I'm going to do 6,000 rounds of 20 mil. Um, this might seem like not that much, but I, I, I typically run my PD pretty short like this. This is oh, just over a minute and a half continuous fire time for the defenders, and same with the flak. If you like having more PD ammunition, then you can uh, certainly do that yourself. It is not. Um, you know, it's not a bad thing to try to bring more PD, but you do have to sacrifice something about this build in order to do that. Uh, this is already very tight. I mean, I'm exactly 3k now, and I just whipped this up. So, um, from here, I'm going to build the formation. Since, um, one thing about backline rail fleets is putting them in formations just gives you ease of control. You don't need to be trying to manually, uh, Trying to manually move each individual rail DD. So you might find this easier, or maybe you want to control them all individually, I don't know. Uh, I'm going to put them about 400 meters away from the censorship, and I'm going to put it so that the... This, the PD rails are slightly ahead of the censorship, just so that the PD, because the, the radar is going to detect incoming missiles before the, um, before the, uh, PD is, like, ever in range, right? So, giving it that slightly extra distance means that if the missiles are ARAD, for instance, then, you know, I, I, you could possibly even move these a little further forward if you really wanted to, um... Giving them that extra little distance just gives some more time for the PD to engage the uh, missiles coming at you. Can't remember. Did I do 400? I did 400. You did 500. Yeah, 500 with the uh, displacement. There we go. Five to 600 works best for rails, I found because you have such a wide angle of fire that there's always going to be at least a couple rails able to fire at stuff as you're maneuvering around, like, wide angle cover. It's mostly for the PD than it is for the rails. Anyway, there you go. That's your uh, backline rail fleet. And this is a very uh, generous fleet in the sense that you can use this in a game by yourself and do something with it. Um, though, again, backline rails are quite difficult to use in general, just because you do really need to be using this to support somebody. Um, don't try flying off and doing this on your own. You're just going to have a pretty bad time, probably. Um, try to coordinate with your teammates using something like this. No one likes people in rails to not doing anything to try to contribute and just shooting random tracks, uh, ask people what they want you to be engaging. Um, and yeah, there you go. So this is the, uh, rail backline. Does anyone have any questions about this? Uh, yes. Crashed asks, uh, what's the, what's the advantage of using a sensor destroyer over a couple of scout sprinters or reins? Um, good question. Uh, in this particular instance, the reason I chose a sensor destroyer was uh, because it's just a single group. I'm trying to make this as friendly to newer players as I possibly can. Um, I will just, I need to 
I already made this fleet, so I don't really need to care about saving it. It's very <clears throat> easy to kite, and you have um, high track qualities. If you don't mind. Uh, having the sensor DD as well also gives you the uh, quad um, track correlator on the spyglass for range, so you can engage a little better doing that. Um, don't mind my names for my fleets. This is an example of what you were talking about. This is another rail DD fleet that I've made. Uh, and this has two stealth Corvettes that are used for locking. It requires a little bit more um, micro in order to control, but uh, you do have... Oh, I thought I had prowlers on this. I guess not. Um, you you can use these a little bit better to get tracks quietly and like you know on your own you can get your tracks yourself like way far out from the rails right so that lets you be a lot safer with the rails in that sense um but you know if the even at 11 and a half kilometers with that quad tc spyglass you're pretty much untouchable to most things that OSP has in terms of guns. Even 450s are going to really struggle to touch you that far out. The only thing you got to be worrying about is um, mass drivers because they're your OSP opposite in some ways, at least thematically. Um, but yeah, it's it's totally valid to use. Uh, Totally valid to use uh, Corvettes like this. And in some ways it is better than doing the TC DD version of this. But uh, again, I just did that with the that particular build because it's a lot easier to manage than, uh, than this particular build. You do need to be very aware of where your Corvettes are. They don't have any PD. <clears throat> They're very sensitive. Um, I hope that answers your question. problem. Any other questions? I see Duck asked a question, but Darg is sort of answering it. Um, my particular take on that for, so it is this little late answer, limited capital railgun, used to be valuable, say in the class 4 pal mount of a 450 solly. Uh, <laughs> actually, a railgun on a 450 Solomon is not entirely terrible because of the way the um the crits work with uh 450 but it's probably better you just bring more 450s in a 450 battleship because you're stacking so much aes and investing so much into the actual gun platform bringing only rail guns with that is gonna cost you energy cost you points and it reduces your 450 output Um, yeah, so again, for the bow on a cello, it's like, yeah, it, it helps in that example, you're right, but um, with, with like I was saying, with the 450 battleship, you're putting so much points into the actual, uh, into the actual gun aspect of your ship to begin with, that that's what you want to go for. You don't really want to be sacrificing your output in that regard. Um, so I'm going to just move on here. No one else has any questions. Let's start the next fleet. This is going to be a missile backline fleet for ANS, which I think is probably something a lot more in people might be interested in than the rails, because this is a actually very good fleet. Uh, this is a S2H beam destroyer backline fleet. Um, you've probably come across this if you've been playing the game for a little while. It's quite an old build, um, but it is still very strong. Um, a lot of people typically build them very similar. It's just very small differences that set them apart from one another. Um, usually you do double missile programming bus for this so that you get the six launch. And then what we want to be doing, ideally, is getting two of these DDs in here. So, yeah, we do four VLS launchers. We're going to do double rapids just for the uh, any kind of damage that we need to do for flanking and moving around the map. 
We're going to leave the regular drive because we really just want to be saving on points. Uh, and then I have a reinforced magazine here. That's probably too much to be honest, but I'm just doing that for now. Um, 530 points for the hull, all this other stuff. And now, you know, the, the thing about missile fleets is most of your points are in the missiles. It's just the way it is. So we're going to go to the missile designer here. We're going to select the cyclone because that's what we want to be building here. We're going to do HEI. Uh, and then we want to make this missile as cheap as humanly possible. That, that, is, that is the main goal of this we want to be using a warhead that is decently sized but capable of well decently sized and capable of destroying things while staying as cheap as we possibly can get it so this there's a bit of an art to this uh i already know exactly how i'm going to be building this particular missile um so you know i have foresight or what's well, not foresight uh hindsight uh, in regards to this, but um, people took a lot of time to actually find out how to build these missiles. It's not something that happens overnight. Missile design is probably one of the most complicated things in Nebulous. And as far as things that are fully gamed out in the game, it's it's not done yet. Like, there's so many possible ways of building missiles that it... it there might you might find a missile design that is good in a particular application and how it's used and that you know that there's an art to that it takes quite a bit of um time and research and in intellect to build a good missile so i'm going to choose a 53 warhead because this is basically the minimum size that you really want for an s2h and the reason for that is if you look down here in the damage Look at armor, 54 centimeters, component damage at 960 hit points. If you don't know, missiles with HEI, unlike HE for cannon rounds, which is a uh, sphere cast for damage, HEI is rays. So the rays will trace out on the impact, and the number of rays is determined by um, your component damage total divided by 50 is equal to each ray is 50 damage is the total number of rays and then I, I believe the remainder is a single ray that does that remainder damage right i can't remember yes yeah, yeah yeah correct that's okay so right so it even says here damage per fragment it's 50. so there you'll get 950 divided by 50 full damage fragments and then one 10 damage fragment yes exactly <laughs> So, from here, what do I want to do? I want crews. This is another important thing here. Backline fleets for missiles. You're doing crews. Um, direct guidance is for frontline missile fleets, largely. Uh, though, you can also use them in DAD fleets as well, uh, and other, like, CAP or support fleets. Since I'm trying to make this really cheap, I'm going to be using the active radar seekers. The base active radar seekers. I'm going to see if I can get away with a steerable. And I'm going to use wake as a backup. Now, the reason I'm using the wake as a backup, and I'm also not going to make this a validator, and I'll explain why in just a second here. The reason I'm using the wake as a backup and not doing a validator is this prevents the missile from acting crazy when it gets jammed. If it's a validator and it gets jammed, the only actual seeker that you have is the active radar seeker. And therefore, I'm pretty sure this auto stages the missiles, actually, if it's just the regular seeker. I can't remember. It's been a while since I've it, paid, paid attention to that. It depends. If you have it um, as a accept all targets validator, like accept unvalidated targets, then it will auto stage when, you, when it gets jammed. There you go. So someone else. But otherwise, it won't see them. So it shouldn't stage. Right. Keyword shouldn't. So the the reason why we're using a targeting missile here, in, or targeting wake seeker instead of validator, is because that is essentially built in instead of being a validator. Um, the wake can't be jammed. Your wake is an unjammable seeker type. Uh, and the reason for that is because it's generally pretty bad otherwise. 
this is just being used so that if it does get jammed, it doesn't just stage immediately and fly off. And also, because with the Radar Seeker as the primary, say you fire a volley off into space somewhere, and the Radar Seeker doesn't catch anything. You, you know, you fired it too late, or you kind of messed up the angle you were launching it at. Who knows? There could be any million number of reasons why the Radar Seeker doesn't actually see anything. If there's a ship trying to run away from you, we'll look at Wake Seeker real quick. It's got 120 degrees field of view. It's the largest field of view for all the Seekers in the game, which actually does make it very useful as a secondary, because what will happen is, if a ship is turning or firing its main drive, the Wake Seeker will detect the Wake particles coming out of that, and missile will stage onto those Wake Seekers, turning the whole missile towards the target. At which point, your primary Seeker, the active steerable, might be able to lock onto it, assuming they don't drop, you know, chaff or something else like that, or find another way to try to prevent your missile from targeting them. And uh, this is the whole thing with the primary versus secondary Seekers. The secondary Seekers will only take over if the primary Seeker cannot get a solid um, target lock. So with that explained, uh, at least I hope that's explained. If anybody else um, has any questions about that particular aspect of missile design, I can explain it, hopefully explain it better. Yes, no, duck, typing. Just wait for your question if you have one. Yeah. I know that felt like a good explanation, but secondaries are really fucking weird. They are. They can be really strange. I have uh, always struggled to explain them properly. Yeah, the basic premise of the secondary is if the primary can't do anything, the secondary takes over. Well, I do actually have a question. Um, so, for the missile in hand, right? So, can I squeeze a point out of just making it a direct gadget um, command? control module and then just have like 12 points instead of 13 points and then just sneak in four, ten more missiles and then try to go for volume of fire and have more missiles. Ideally, uh, just slightly peak or angle the VLS so that it launches and doesn't hit an asteroid. So, yes, in theory. Uh, if you wanted to make these direct guidance, direct guidance is zero points and cruise is two. So it is a tax. Cruise is a tax. Mm -hmm. Again, this, like I said earlier, this is a tutorial on backline fleets, and you cannot really use direct guidance as a backline missile platform because of the way it works. Cruise allows you to actually launch at far distances, right? Part of the reason okay. I made the cruise speed 275 meters per second at 20 approximately 20 kilometers range. This lets you shoot across the entire map for most maps. Uh, large maps, it will you know, it's different, but we're just not going to touch that conversation just yet. Um, in, theory, in theory, you could bring this to a direct and then, you know, angle your ship in such a way that you're peaking, you know, like, say, for instance, there's a rock like this. You could, in mm -hmm. theory, direct fire straight and the missiles would launch over the rock and you're still in cover. Yes, that is a, that is a tactic you're doing. You do need to be careful about that, though, because of the way that the missile... Um, I, I don't know exactly how the game decides this, but I know that when you are firing missiles and you have more than one VLS launcher, it's going to launch the missiles from multiple launchers. Though sometimes yeah. it doesn't, but it's just not something you can actually control. You can't choose yeah. which launcher the missiles are coming out of. All right, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah, I can give the missile a name. Um, would gearing missile backline fleets to fight other missile backline fleets be viable, or should you just stick to targets you can actually see? Um, this is... So, all missile backline fleets are geared to fight other missile backline fleets. That is one of the really interesting dynamics between these kinds of fleets, actually. Um... There's a lot of metagaming involved in, and this is a lot of like skill-based stuff that you just have to pick up. 
it's not something that can really be taught so to speak like someone can teach you the quote uh typical places that someone is going to be unquote <laughs> with with another missile fleet on any particular map but you're going to have to largely learn that on your own based off of the players that you play against and you will pick up certain behaviors that other people repeat or you'll play against someone multiple times and you'll be like okay i know this person likes to do this thing and this is where they hide when they play missile fleet again like there's a lot of metagaming involved in that um so yeah it, it, it again like all missile fleets are at least backline missile fleets are geared to fight other missile backline fleets it's one of the few examples of a very binary but direct counter to one another you know, whoever finds whoever first dies, essentially. You know, like, none of these ships have any PD on them, really. I mean, I have two defenders on this one, but it's it's not a lot. That's not going to stop anything serious. Duh. Trust me, when someone finds a 1.5k missile destroyer, they're going to throw everything they have at it. Um... Yeah, so I'm just gonna add the birthing in here. And then give this thing a name. Um So then we're just gonna fill up the I really hope I did this right. Fill up the launchers. Ooh, fifteen seventy. What did I do wrong? Oh, I know what I did wrong. So this is <laughs> this is the engine configuring, and this is a part of the whole. You'll notice, like right here, right, it goes from thirteen to twelve, right here, seven oh seven. With S two H, is you largely want to be having high speed. Uh, having high velocity on S two H's is what keeps them alive from flak. There's this top speed acceleration. I explained this a little while ago to people, but um, during your acceleration phase of the sprint stage, uh, the missile is effectively immune to flak because it has a changing acceleration. And the flak's PD controller is incapable of um, determining where the missile will be next because of that changing acceleration. So you're your missiles are effectively immune to flak for 0.1 or 0 0.7 seconds and 0 0.7 seconds uh i mean there's the math i'm not going to try to do the math behind this in my head but basically the distance that you're staging at two kilometers by the time you're actually at a constant speed you're like 500 meters away from the target and your maximum speed is 707 meters per second and um that's essentially less than a second of time for the flak to actually lead properly on the missile. So you're going to hit. Like, this is the advantage of hybrids for OM ANS. It's uh, very difficult for OSP to deal with this, and that is a part of some of the changes that are coming to the um, test branch, uh, i.e. the grazer is trying to be fixed in some ways to do this. Though, one thing about S2H is, if you're trying to fight these as OSP, uh, AMMs are really good against them, and so is Grape right now, actually, in a weird way, because they only have 25 body integrity. Grape does exactly 25 damage. If you can hit these things with Grape from range, they just die in one shot. And uh, AMMs are also very effective against them in general, because they have short staging distances, unlike S3H. Um, so, you know, AMMs are a lot better against these things than they are against S3H. So yeah, this brings us down to 1490, which is exactly what I wanted. I have 10 points left over to do something with, and I don't really know what to do that with, so I'm just going to put another burr thing, because whatever. And then, or sorry, adding auxiliary steering. <laughs> uh, just, you know, if you get hit and you get completely clapped, but your... Um, Auxiliary steering is still there to move the ship around. You can still help your team out by trying to cap points, and that's always useful. So, this ship is exactly one and a half 
thousand points, you'll notice that, like I was mentioning earlier, most of the point value is in the missiles. 64% of the total cost of the ship is in the missiles alone. I'm going to duplicate this, and now we have a 3K fleet where nearly 2,000 points worth of missiles is stuffed into two beam destroyers. The reason the beams are on there is so that once you run out of uh, missiles, you are at least somewhat useful for defending points. Like was mentioned earlier, beam DDs for backline defense. That's what these are doubling as once they don't have any missiles left. They're useless otherwise, so you might as well try to do something, right? So there's your backline ANS missile fleet. Uh, are there any questions on this? No, no questions. Okay, so yeah, uh, sorry, I missed that uh, part with the internals. I should have gone over that, but yeah, so you get 12 missile volley out of this, <clears throat> which is pretty strong. That'll go through. Ooh, what the hell? My power is really bad. Oh, that's just the beam. Yeah, I did something wrong here. I don't think you can actually use this. <laughs> I suppose you could turn your radar off and then use the beam while spotting with the other DD. So keep that in mind. I My other fleet actually works properly. I don't, I don't know. Oh, right. I remember what I did. It's not another aux. It's another, it's a micro reactor. My bad. So yeah, don't forget the micro reactor. That that that's what those ten extra points are for. <clears throat> Just gonna overlap overlap this fleet actually. I don't think I did that with the other one. Okay, so on to uh, uh... you do have a question on um. Oh, sorry. What would yeah. be best for ANS missile boats? Like pros and cons on a. Uh... Rains, yeah, box, or keys for that. missile boats? Pros and cons. Um, okay, so Rains has the best. Let's quickly go through it. Oops. Realistically, uh, you can do missile fleets on every single one of the hulls that I've just done. So it's it's all the hulls except for the BB uh, that are good. I mean, the BB you can do a missile fleet if you really want to do an extremely cursed build. But um, sprinters, sprinters are really good missile ships. Uh, their advantages are speed and um, stealth, so they're very quiet. Uh, they're hard to detect, hard to track, hard to do anything about when they decide they want you to die from range with missiles, though they are largely used for direct fire. They are they don't need to rely off of crews because they can move around the map so quietly and very quickly. Uh, the Reigns is... This has the single best point per tube value for all of ANS, so you can get the most missiles per points on a single... Frigate. That is the advantage of the reins. It's best left as a back, a true backline cruise missile. It's not the same as the Sprinter in that way. You can't really fly around the map very quickly. DDs are similar to uh, reins, but they work better for S2H hybrids for some, well, not really some strange reason, but it's, it has to do with the balance of points because hybrids cost more points. Reins are better with uh, S3H and S2. Um, DDs are better with uh, torpedoes because they can be used as frontline for that, and then also with S2H because of the the point cost. So the you know you can't you can build an S2H frigate if you want, but um, the tube efficiency is actually better for it on the DD just because of the points. The Vauxhalls are better as frontline uh, direct fire. Uh, missile carriers, but they can also function as backline cruisers. Um, though they struggle with mount efficiency and also with programming channels. Well, 
Actually, okay, that's really weird because programming channels are really good on CLs in some ways and then bad in other ways. You kind of need to commit to S3H or S2H or S2s. Torpedo Voxel. Like, if you choose Torpedo Voxels, it's a front line. Mixing all the stuff together doesn't really work that well because of the way that the channel efficiency works for the missiles. Like, it's, it's quite complicated. Missile design for CL, I think, is probably one of the more nuanced ones. Um, and then Axfords. Probably, uh, I think Axfords actually have the best uh, tube efficiency for VLS-3 out of all the ANS ships. Um, but they also are a capital ship. If you're building, like, just like the CL, you know, it's a single missile boat, right? And also the problem with the Axford is, uh, unlike, say, for instance, the CL, where you have multiple tubes, like, launchers like this, they're all going to be launching at the same time. So you get a lot of volume density out of a CL. On an Axford, there's very little volume density. Um, volume density is a really big thing with missiles. You can often have a volley on an Axford, for instance, that is larger than that on a CL, but it doesn't get through the PD because the volume density is lower. It doesn't have as many mounts to be able to actually fire the missiles. Um, you'll see S2 CHs, S3 H CHs, like all sorts of CHs. Typically, they'll bring a beam, and they're often frontline, right? So... Missile fleets for ANS are quite, uh, there's a lot of variability in them. And there's some that are just blatantly better than others, like back, rain, back lane. Uh, Reigns are definitely the best missile fleets in the game. Uh, and sub corvettes are among the best missile fleets in the game. And in my personal opinion, the missile voxel is always the best, but <laughs> depends who you ask. Okay, uh, King Gizzard asked a question high speed or maneuverability and rely on corkscrew and weave to get through PD for hybrids. Uh, sorry, where is this that I'm reading? Question, I don't know what she said. But yeah, that. What should I prioritize for hybrid missiles? I see, high speed. For high, for S2H is always speed. Always speed. It it uh, it needs that speed to get through the PD. Um, for S3Hs, you have a little bit more wiggle room with that. Haha, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, and the reason for that is because they have higher body integrity. They can take a little bit more punishment. Um, you can get S3Hs down to 500 meters per second, and as long as they have weave, they will get through significant point defense. Um, corkscrew, in my opinion, is not necessarily worth the price. Uh, a lot of other people will disagree with that in their own way. They'll say it's better for some things. I think weave is pretty much the only kind of point, or, or uh, Aid that you really need in terms of terminals. Cork is better in some ways, but weave is it's weave is good enough, and you don't need to let perfect be the enemy of good enough. Um, for S three H's, yeah, like just quickly through here. So for this, you know, like even all the way down here. Oh, it's five fifty now. It's minimum. Interesting. Um, I would not recommend a kilometer a second for S3Hs. Uh, another thing you should also pay attention to is minimum angle versus free approach. This is something on direct missiles. Free approach causes the missile to go in a perfectly straight line when it stages. Uh, minimum angle gives you, quote, free weave, where the missile will move back and forth slightly. It's not nearly as good as actual weave, but uh, it does work. Cruise Guidance is purely minimum angle every time it stages. It doesn't get the option of Free Approach. Uh, free Approach is best used for instant stage missiles. No speed. To sp uh, yes, so Corkscrew, again, expensive. Weave is usually good enough. How do you counter large swarms? <clears throat> yeah, um, as Derek mentioned, RPF, good. 
uh, if you're using, again, like, I'm trying to keep this topic mostly relating to backline. If you're using frontline missiles against a swarm, it's a little bit different. Backline missiles against swarms, like, you need to be finding ways to get the volley on them in a way they can't defend against, which can be quite difficult. Um, typically what you want to be doing is helping someone else that's trying to directly engage the swarm, because swarms will often have jamming, right? But they can't jam your missiles and your opponent at the same time, unless they're very quick. And if you're smart about the pathing of your missiles, they won't have any time to do it at all, especially with hybrids. <clears throat> so for uh, these, I'm... like, for those H3s, right, you have the primary, your secondary seeker, do you put any support module in, or have any yeah, for those, like the boosted self-screening jammers or things like that. Uh, yeah, okay, I will, you know, I'm just going to demonstrate. This is one of my most favorite missiles that I use. It's an instant stage heck key. I use decoys on this. Um, this is, uh, decoys are one of the, are probably the best pen aid right now, to be honest. Um, hardened skin has really fallen from grace. Uh, hopefully that will be changed within the next iteration of the game. Radar absorbent coating is unfortunately also a little bit in the bin right now because it was extremely broken at one point and had to be nerfed. Double radar uh, absorbent coating was so good that you literally couldn't see the missile until visual range. So <laughs> it got a mega nerf and now it doesn't really do very much. Self-screening jammers, very good against active missile, or like if your opponents, for, against OSP especially, right, because they rely off of AMMs to actually be able to cut down missiles. Um, Self-screening jammer is very good for that because it forces them to use command, and command AMMs are very expensive. Uh, it is an expensive module in itself, it's five points, but if you mix these in with your salvos, like even just one of them, if one of them is a self-screening jammer with your salvo, it can completely negate any non-command AMM that's fired at your volley. So they are very useful. Boosted self-screening jammer is very similar, more expensive, but uh, this prevents the PD from targeting from range. So something like um, Aurora's, for instance, on an Acello or Sarissa, uh, they'll jam the target out, and then the radar on that ship can no longer... Um, assign targets to the PD. So uh, self-screening jammer, boosted self-screening jammer, decoys are the three really good pen aids right now. Uh, radar absorbent coating is essentially useless. Hardened skin is not good. Uh, and fast startup module has some use cases. Uh, and it is very strong in those some use cases, but is otherwise not particularly useful. But I'm not going to go into what those use cases are. I will let you figure that out on your own. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, but for like the boosted self-screening, it's a cone coming out of the front, right? So you want it to hit last. Will you change your engine speed on staging so it's slower so it hits last? Because I've uh, had some where that will hit first, and then the PD will get the rest of the missiles behind it. Because it was staged first. You don't need to do that. In your missile planner, since ANS has missile planner, uh, make sure that this is the last missile you select. And it, then it, it will was. Be the last to launch. But oh, when it... Feet, so sometimes it's launching in earlier. Yeah, well, they will launch as a group, right? And it just gets mixed in the middle, or it's coming out of a top tube or a bottom tube. And it's just some things are getting in um, before it, like just how the angling is working. What what ship are you using to launch? Uh, the reins. Okay. And like, you're using you're using multiple. Yeah, multiple S three launches. Like no, right. multiple reins. I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it it will sometimes like the supports. Um, uh, it happens really bad if I use a CL, one of the CLs. Because if I have, if the supports are on like the bottom launcher and um, I'm attacking something that's more angled towards the top launcher, those, the missiles that are coming out of the top will, will hit first. Like if the, if it's programmed to come out of the bottom launcher. Um, you can't choose which launcher the missiles are coming yeah. out of unless you are specifically putting only the missile in one specific launcher. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. I was like, I, that, I have a couple times. 
what you're going to want to do is put your first cruise waypoint um, in sort of an even line on your ships, like an even plane kind of in the okay. middle of the reins. Right, um, okay, I understand what you're saying Offset now. from your ships a little bit, and that'll make it to where the top launcher and bottom launcher missiles get to that first waypoint at roughly the same time. And that'll solve that problem a little better. I'll, I will just demonstrate what he's talking about real quick to you. I really so need would to get you, rid of that. Would you put well. like a targeting point there? Oh, I guess you can't do the rest of the waypoints off that. I wish I could. You watch. Aye, aye, forming on guide. Standing by. So. I choose middle point. Well, I'm just going to do it behind me just so that they don't get killed immediately. But um, right here, it's on the same plane as all the other ships, right? Yeah. Preparing missile launch. So these Ready missiles forward. should all activate their engines at near the same time. You'll notice they turn. See? And now your volley is dense. Obviously, this is a pretty uh, crazy angle that I told them to fly at, so. We're running out of missiles. That'll... You can be more careful about your positioning, because obviously, this, again, like I did a very weird. Uh, <laughs> loop right here it's pretty much impossible don't uh stage somewhat apart from each other you can't really get that all of them staging at the same time that's not really possible <clears throat> yeah i just have my on my supports i have my cruise speed like a meter a second slower so it's always arriving a little bit later is how if, i solved it here's here's what i'm going to say to that if that works for you and you find that works then keep doing it okay uh personally for me i when i'm using something like vssj like that when the missiles get so close like if you're finding that the vssj is staging too early and like all the other missiles are way far behind then do what you need to do in order to make it so that your timing is correct. That's what the most important part is for myself. Like I, I just don't really have situations where that's happening for me. So I can't really answer that other than saying, um, plan out how, like doing what Darg said, planning out so your missiles are launching all at the same time in one particular direction, and then gently smoothly turning them around to, all be in this big cloud together right because they all they all hit the cruise at the same time so they should be all near each other and if you do that correctly even bssj that stages first by the time it's like halfway to the target the rest of the missiles are already staging behind it and again the pd controller on the target ship um the only thing bssj does is reduce the range that it's you know, uh, targeting at. So once it actually gets a lock, the PD's firing one way or the other. Um, and if you do the timing right with that, and they're all kind of like launching at the same time and activating their cruise engines at the same time, they're all going to arrive at roughly the same time. And that difference of even two kilometers for S3H is very negligible. By the time the BSSJ hits the target, the rest of the missiles are probably already halfway there anyways. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time on missiles, so I'm going to move on now to um, OSG backline. Can I interject on this? You may. Okay, so you just make your main missile third and your BSSJ. So if the, if both missiles stage at the same range, make the missiles you want to arrive first faster in the sprint stage. You don't need to fiddle with the cruise. You just need to make it so that once they stage, the BSSJ is slower than your like striker or whatever you want to call it. 
yes, that is also a way to do that. I don't know why I didn't think of that. Thank you, Seeger. So, uh, OSP backline, we're going to start with energy again, same as we did before. Um, obviously, this is just going to be uh, mass drivers because this is the premier energy long range weapon for OSP, the opposite being the uh, plasma cannon. So, um, personally, I there's a lot of different ways that people will discuss for mass drivers. Some people prefer high alpha for the four mass drivers. Um, personally, I think the optimal setup is the 15 rounds per minute with the large yard. So I'm just going to do that and demonstrate that. And for this, I'm going to do the same uh, control stack that I did before for this. So I'm just going to do RMAG, RDC, RCIC at the front, just in case the ship does get hit by something. And the reason for that is just to... It gives you a little bit more protection with three R components on the nose. <clears throat> and uh, for mass drivers, you're going to want E-regs and light civilian reactors. So triple E-reg, I believe, brings me to 15. Yep, and then I can just do all civilian reactors for the remainder. And then I'm going to do two plant control centers. And the two plant control centers bring my power up with the boosted. And this is exactly what I want for uh, this particular ship. So I'm just going to look at my rounds per minute. 15 put just over... 10 or just over 20 minutes of fire, similar to with the rail DDs. Um, you're probably not going to run out of ammo, but there might be a situation where you do. I have yet to run out of map fracturing blocks for my mass driver fleets, but I have gotten close. I think I've been down to 50 rounds before, but when a game ended, uh, I'm going to just fill the back slots here with, um, Ox steering and a couple rapids, plus a large storage just for the restores. If the ship does get hit by a missile and things get knocked out, I have the one restore in the RDC to repair the large DC locker, which gives you four extra restores for anything else that might need to be repaired. Um, LNs have really wacky damage models, as anybody that has played this game would know. At least extensively, you'll realize this. Sometimes you'll just, like, these ships can get hit by heck peas bow to stern and only the fucking middle components will get taken out. Uh, sometimes your whole ship just dies flat out to that as well. Um, same with HEI. Things can hit you and they'll do nothing or other times they'll do way more than you think they should. Other times you get hit by one missile and suddenly your structure broke uh, but nothing else is damaged in the ship. Things like that. They're really weird hulls. Um... And then I need a berthing, of course. So this is a pretty basic layout for it. This is how I build my uh, mass driver LNs. Well, I usually put jam tainers on the back. This is kind of a bit of a joke thing that I made, but it actually does work for protecting you. Uh, you can put decoys on the back as well and fly them around your ship to protect you from missile strikes. Otherwise, this fleet or this ship is just under a K. And then I'm going to duplicate that, so I have two of them. And from here, and remember, this is on test branch as well, so this is going to be, this is the new monitor for the test branch, so it's a little bit different than uh, the current monitor in the game. The reason I'm using the monitor for my tracking is because, well, other than the changes, is I wouldn't do this otherwise. I would use a tug for this otherwise, but I want this to be future-proofed a little bit. I'm going to do a um, adaptive radar receiver, track correlators, more track correlators and this gives me oh wait a minute sorry one more adaptive three track correlators and two adaptives for 56 decibels and 15 meters positional error this is a pretty good bloodhound this lets you track things pretty far out uh and with decent accuracy the ship is also Far enough away to not be spotted by any ANS radars, unless it's a pinard. Um, 
obviously you want to be careful of that too. Like this thing is genuine missile bait effectively. Uh, they're going to try to kill this thing as quickly as they can. I'm going to set up the internals in a way that gives me as much protection as possible. Like I said, stacking three components together that are R modules reduces the damage that they all uh, they all take. And the DR, the DR will protect you and they won't uh, gray out potentially. Though I believe on a monitor it might actually be slightly too low to seriously stop uh, gray out from HE. Uh, plus the changes to armor do make you a lot more resistant to guns in general. You could do more to this monitor if you wanted to, but I am not going to bother with that. I don't really want to spend the time trying to figure out what I'm going to do with it beyond that. So I'm just going to add a birthing. And then I'm going to add a large DC storage just in case I do get hit. Uh, again, just to repair the ship. And then from here, I'm going to build some sacrificial gun shuttles. And the reason for this is uh, OSP kind of relies on um, volume. You uh, need a lot of ships in order to see things, do things, and help your team out. And um, bringing shuttles like this, no ones. Bringing shuttles like this will help you get tracks. I'm going to put a pinpoint on them. They're pretty hard to spot at range, but they'll give you tracks for your mass drivers at the back. Um, and they can also do other jobs too for your fleet. It's better to, uh, similar to what I was saying with the DD as well, I'm building a fleet that isn't pure greed. You could, in theory, just bring three of these mass driver ships if you wanted, but then you're entirely reliant on your teammates. So that's the same theme that I'm going with here. Uh, then I'm just going to copy this three times and see what points I have left over, and then make these all reinforced. Suppose I could also reinforce the CIC for this. Then do an R drive, R drive, R drive. Oh, I forgot about this. Oh, nice. New points on 100 allow you to actually bring reasonable amounts of ammunition for a single point. I do have three points left over, so I'm just going to, or maybe, what I could do is reduce the ammunition load. Possibly, that might be a bad idea though. I'm just going to do this instead because I can't be bothered to spend time trying to add a VLS one for chaff on the uh, monitor. Though I would recommend if you decide to build a fleet like this on your own, try to find a way to get a VLS one with chaff onto this monitor simply to help you not die immediately to active radar missiles. Uh, and you know, if they have a rad act, which is a very common seeker combination, you just turn off the R 400 and um, dump some chaff and then, monitor will be safe. So that's the backline OSP fleet. The way you play this, of course, is the three, uh, un, you know, this is a lot more micro intensive than the DD fleet. Uh, it's more similar to what I showed before as well with the double um, Corvettes for offset scouting for locks behind the lines for range on the rail DDs. This is plays more similar to that. These three Corvette or three shuttles they're going to be played separately and around the map to try to get locks far and also give you a little bit of sensor coverage with the bridge masters. The R400 monitor is also going to be played independently from the two mass drivers, which are also independently played from one another. So you're having to micro six ships here instead of a single formation. It is quite a bit more control required in order to play a mass driver fleet. But quite frankly, once you understand how to do heading for mass drivers, it's not that complicated. You just turn bow aim gun and start doing a ton of damage to people and make people sad. Uh, so yeah. 
Uh, anyone else have any questions? Yeah, Duck asks, would limited use of mass drivers be viable? Say one or two mass feeders supporting a liner or a cello, or should you go all in? Um, one or two are viable, I think. I've been playing around with the idea of a single, especially because of the changes to the monitor right now. Um, I haven't experimented enough with it, but I actually think that a single, like, 500-point mass driver monitor within a uh osp like data or support fleet might be kind of useful because you can get six rounds per minute out of that and it's i mean it's not as optimal as doing an ln with mass drivers because like this is going to have three times the output for two-thirds the cost of this equivalent amount for uh, monitors but um yeah you can definitely do uh some support mass driver like even doing a single mass driver um ln in the back like i i think one of my yeah one of my ln fleets is like that this is a really good combination of ships um using one plasma with the spin liner on the back 250s on the back 250s on one of the liners and then the backline liner with all mass drivers i really like this fleet it's very fun uh you can do some pretty good stuff with this and you can kind of like scout for yourself because you're playing the half frontline fleet as well. And the mass driver can also support your teammates. Um, you can also do this with, uh, let's see here. I probably have a fleet like this. Yeah, here we go. So this is like a dad slash support fleet. Uh, and this has a mass driver ship in it with, um, this isn't a great fleet, to be honest. I would change some things about this, but you have a bunch of rocket shuttles for capping and ambushing shit and killing it. Uh, and then you've got a R400 tug for spotting to help teammates plus a mine layer. I just did this because I was experimenting with mines. I would take this out now. Um, it wasn't terrible. It, I really liked this fleet while I was using it, but again, I did change a lot of stuff about this because I found out that a 500 point tug with mines in it just really was not particularly worth it. <laughs> um, and then of course the mass driver LN for supporting. So it's definitely totally viable. If you want to just bring a single mass driver LN, it, I, I, I highly recommend that in a fleet. It's really good. I think you're saying more like a singular or double mass driver. What do you, what think, what do you, does that mean? Single double mass driver? Like, I think he was asking about just bringing one or two. Specifically on, on cargo feeders. On cargo feeders. Yeah, again, uh, on main branch, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> it's just, like, you're going to get, like, on main branch right now, here, I'll just show you, right? On main branch right now, you've only got, you've only got these three modules. And even when you remove all that stuff, right? Like, it's triple. Oh, I guess it's five now. What? The monitor's also a lot uh, more easily killed on main branch as well. Yes. I didn't realize it was... I don't know. I, maybe, but to be honest, I I really question the viability of this. Um, I would experiment with it, definitely. So, my answer to that question is... Kind of, yes. It's really good at shooting spyglass rains that have gotten a little too close and that you've managed to lock. It's really good at shooting uh, lone sprinters. Just any sort of small ship that's out of position, it's good at punishing that. But it's not going to, like, dramatically improve your killing capacity against any sort of ship that has mass. Yes, exactly. Can I uh, say something as well? Yeah, go ahead. If you go with the monitor, the monitor is 500 points, as you can see. You're not really getting a lot out of it. If you if you want a single one, a single monitor, yes, it's okay. But if you want to bring two, then don't. Bring an LN. Yeah, bring an LN, 100%. Because the LN is just going to have way better output for the price point. Yeah, it's like, I don't know, three to one or some shit. It, yeah, it's it's three to two. So these two are nearly a thousand for 12.5 RPM. 
the Mass Driver LN, as we demonstrated earlier, was 15.4 for the same price point. So you're getting more output from that. Though it is a lot closer than I thought it was. <laughs> I will say that. Uh, at least now it is, because that is 6.29. So that is just under 13 versus 15 for the... Um, the main branch ones are 11.25. Yeah, it, it's it's worse on main branch right now. The reason I'm doing it on this is just for uh, because the game is yeah. going to be more declined. Uh, anyway, so that's uh, energy weapons backline for OSP. Uh, any more questions on that? Or... Yeah, yeah Andrew, I got one. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Duck asks in the text chat, is it worth bringing Realisillos to fight Balon, Solomons, and Axfords? Uh, that is... That really depends who you're asking. Yeah, I'm uh, kind of answering that in, the, in an even way in text chat. Yeah, I I would say no, because Realisillos are quite an investment, um, and they don't really add too much to your team. Though, that being said, I have seen Railguns on 450 Acellos work in interesting ways that you would not think should work. Uh, Acellos should be used as support ships, but with Railguns, it's kind of like you're going a little too hard into the support. And, um, yeah, personally, I would just say no. They, they, there's better options for trying to kill uh, battleships and experts than using rail cellos for that. And you're also kind of making quite a very specific engagement profile just to bring rail cellos. Uh, yeah, like they're, they're not going to do too much against anything else. And their output is also not amazing. Uh, what were you going to ask, Spicy? Uh, what are some theoretically possible OSP builds that you don't really see at all? What do you mean? With regards to Vacline? Uh, just in general. I'm not going to touch that because it's not the subject of this fleet tutorial. Fair, yeah. I'll ask later. Um, so if there is no other questions, I will now demonstrate a OSP missile backline fleet. For this, I'm going to be using the monitor. And uh, the reason for that is because the monitor is a pretty great S2 boat. And I'm just going to put a bunch of MLS2 on here. And with the changes to the MLS2 and monitor, you can now do five MLS2s on a monitor, giving you a volley size of 40. And as OSP, you really want to be um, getting that volume. It's pretty, uh, pretty integral to, uh, to getting your volley through point defense, because ANS point defense is pretty strong against you. Um, Largely, people are just running flak and defenders. It's sort of an omni-defense against OSP missiles right now. That's most people who are experienced in this game or even have some minimal experience in this game will know. Uh, as a backline fleet, of course, uh, and being monitors, these things are just going to be empty. I don't need radar. It's pointless. It's just taking points away from my missiles. Um, I'm going to use the Tempest. I want range and i also want some speed so i'm gonna try to find a way to keep that whilst also being able to hit from distance so mm, i wouldn't go lower than 250 personally even you could get away with 225 but you're really really pushing it so i'm gonna do 260 new cruise of course and then again, the whole premise behind this as well. This is going to be a little bit different for OSP versus the ANS uh, uh, missile fleet, backline missile fleet. Uh, we're going to try to do a high-low approach to this. 
So what that means is we're going to do one really cheap shit missile and then one very expensive Gucci missile that can do a lot for us. I'm going to use active wake validation because it's basically cheap EO for uh, OSP. So this gives us 14 kilometer range S2s. That's not bad. I mean, you could probably find a way to mess around with this a little more if you wanted to. With a size 5 warhead, which allows us to attack battleships. You don't really want it. You could do four if you want. I do run six four S twos, but uh, again, and it does give you a little bit more range. But again, you need to remember you can't kill battleships, and against even larger ships uh, like the CL or the um, well, I guess the CL would probably die to this in one volley. But uh, an Axford would be able to take one volley from this and still be kind of okay. Um, so typically, you do want to try to get that extra warhead size if you can. So with that in mind, we've and then notice too the points here. This is only three hundred five. You can choose to put ammunition elevators on this. MLS two does benefit from ammunition elevators to get the volley rate up. Uh, it might be worth that. In this example, I'm going to choose not to do that to try to maximize ma uh, magazine depth. So we're going to do oh, 72 for the reinforced. Right. Well, I guess we're doing a bulk magazine. 108. 108 total? 106. Right. So with that, we'll do 80 of our basic missiles. Which leaves us with approximately 500, yeah, 555 points to get some really Gucci missiles. That's quite a lot of points to be able to do that. So we're going to do EO and we're going to do decoys. Because that's what everyone does for this stuff. Might as well. And we'll see how many of those we can get. Oops. Oh. Well. That's better than I expected. So we can get a single volley of the uh, EODs and then four volleys of radar uh, active wake. This is pretty good. Um, considering we're going to add another monitor to this, what you can do is you can have one monitor loaded with the uh, EOD first and the act wake and then do a double volley from both of them and fire 40 missiles where half the volley is EOD and the other half is act wake. Uh, this way you get the benefits of both worlds. Um, and you, you know, 20 EOD is like, that's a lot of decoys. Most of PD setups are going to struggle against that to begin with. So uh, we're going to do that. And then, I mean, you know, like really at this point, could just bring more missiles if you really wanted to, but it's let's just put in some DC just in case. Let's see, I think maybe no, it's too much. Do two rapids. Oh, two rapids, and then I'm just gonna make the CIC RCIC. Whatever. Can probably find a way to uh, optimize this, but just for example's sake. And we got two of them. Um, there you go. That's the backline missile fleet with monitors. Um, yeah. Any questions? Pretty simple. Backline fleets are quite simple once you understand. You can only put your, uh, your MLS-2s into fire groups, so you can choose the uh, amount of EO decoy versus half wake. That is also a good point. You can do that. So we can do EOD. Something like that. If we really wanted to. Now we're doing volleys of 8 with EOD and then 32 with uh, Act Wake. This does help your volley. Thank you for pointing that out, actually. You should be more prepared for this. 
Um, yeah. Any more questions or are we, uh, anyone good here? We seem so to be good. Just, yeah, just final remarks here too, similar to the ANS one. Uh, again, like this is over 2,000 points worth of missiles. Backline missile fleets are like that. That's just what it is, right? You're mostly missiles. The hull is just there to carry the missiles. That's that's the whole point of the fleet. Um, energy weapon backline fleets are a little bit more. Um, there's a little bit more variability to them. Um, you can do a little bit more, though. I would say this fleet in particular, uh, actually, the fact that the monitor can now launch twenty missiles in a single volley with this particular setup, I, I, I would even be tempted to bring a single one of these just to like murder individual ships that are by themselves that aren't capitals or have lower point defense or something. Like this is actually kind of this could be useful in other ways than just doing two of them and spamming a bunch of missiles. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that for the ANS DD one simply because of the channel size. Uh, you only get six channels for each DD, so it's a bit different. Um, and yeah, those are my closing remarks. So thanks for coming and watching, and I hope that you learned something if you are new to the game. Uh, and if you are experienced, then hopefully you didn't cringe too hard. I didn't up until that ending. <laughs> eh, hopefully everyone learned something, though uh, I have a lot less to say on backlines than I do frontline. I have something to say about this fleet. Please it do has tell. an engine. Oh, you're right. You're very it right. Has a reinforced CIC. You have DC and the reinforced CIC. This is heretical. Oh, what what do we like? What are we doing here, Seeger? You're right. You, you need more, more missile. <laughs> more missile. <laughs> more missile. My main it's issue very right now simple. with it is the not even salvo size. Yeah. The EO is twenty when the salvo size is sixteen. No, the salvo size is twenty. The salvo There's size of the EO oh, yeah. is going to be four, um, and you're going to get five of those. Right. Well, I, I I meant just that there are five MLS twos. This is an even split for the volley size. Yep. This is the test branch again. Just uh, as a reminder, I, the reason I'm doing this on the test branch is because the game is going to be more similar to the test branch when it gets updated than it is on main right now. So I'm trying to future proof this video a little bit. Anyway, uh, that's going to be that. Thanks for watching. Thanks for coming. Uh, like I said before, hope you learned something. If not, well, I hope it was enjoyable sitting around and listening. Uh, yeah. You should have told me you were recording. I would have put my makeup on. <laughs> if anyone uh, has any more questions or anything they want to ask, uh, there are quite a few people in here that probably know things that could benefit you if you are new otherwise um yeah be around for a bit and then i'm gonna take off so yeah i'm gonna dip out and do a closer uh, good work asked if you've already done frontline fleets i have okay there is that backline video. Big thanks to Hunter for doing that. He's kind of the one of the premier masterminds on fleet building, and he's got a mind for making things noob friendly as well. So that's why he's running that. He's got a bit of a passion for teaching, spreading knowledge to the people. Um, you can find some people who play better, but no one who can build fleets quite like that man. And give them to uh, new replacers. Of course, Seeger came out and was there as well. You heard his voice a couple times, mostly interjecting and being silly. Um, but he's also one of the extremely good players. 
talking about. Who can do such things? We, uh... That was a little more... Refined than the first one. A little less hectic. It was also recorded in higher quality. And I'm not going to have to deal with cutting it down either. So that's good. It was also shorter. Hour and a half. Backline fleets. Um, did he miss anything? So, capital rails are technically viable, are technically usable. They're just extremely difficult to use effectively, to get value out of. And if you don't know what you're doing, like really know what you're doing, you need to know the insides and the outsides of both your ships and your opponent's ships, or rather their likely builds. And that's that's not very new player friendly. Um, as regards railguns, you're going to want to have as much fire time as possible. Okay, so we're actually going to touch on something a little advanced here. A hunter didn't go over. Backline fleets do not stay in spawn. Backline fleets... Uh, I guess I should maybe do this in the Discord. Oh, well, fuck it. I already closed out of that. Backline fleets are backline. They are behind your frontline ships and your midline ships. If you have any, midline's less common because it's not as needed. But they do not stay parked in spawn. You're going to want to be, you kind of want to be as close to the fight as you can without actually being in the fight. And that's very difficult to do, by the way. So don't fret if you can't do that very well. Because that'll give you the best ability to aim around things. So, and that, that's just, that's just basic geometry. And, uh, it, it takes a lot longer to move and adjust your sight lines meaningfully the further away you are from a hunk of cover, uh, a piece of rock in space. So you want to be kind of close, but not like actually in the fight, and that's very difficult to do. But that's that's the most important takeaway from backline fleets. Um, obviously, rails are going to want direct sight line. Cruise missile ships, however, want to deny sight lines. So they want to be parked behind rocks. The reason missile ships want to be closer to the fight... So rails want to be close so they can get the right angle. Missile ships want to be close-ish. Remember, not actually in the fight. So that they can... It's, it's less time in between their launching and their landing of missiles. They can more easily shoot things on different parts of the map. Uh, and if someone goes on a crazy flank with some really small ships and says, ha ha, I've got your back line, um, they're a lot closer to help. So you can call for your voxel friend or your uh, Doug Swarm friend to save you from impending doom from the handful of rocket shuttles or the handful of torpedo sprinters that have suddenly appeared over the top of the map. It'll keep you safe. And it also makes it to where staying closer, close-ish to the front line, keeps you safe as a backline player and puts you in a good position to deal damage. Because in Nebulous, everything, everything, everything boils down to positioning. I hope you found that useful. Uh, this was hosted out of the main Nebulous Discord. There are a lot of people in there who provide information, who do things of this sort to help newer players because Nebulous is a very dense and complicated game. It's hard to get a grasp on. Uh, and so we think that it's important to provide, that the community provides as much as they possibly can to the newer players. Uh, and that link's going to be in the description. I'm also going to have those fleets linked in the description so you can you can have access to those i'm gonna put those on a google drive my just my personal google drive i guess and uh what else what else what else oh yeah you might have noticed me going oh that's my build earlier uh that was something i built and shared in a server that hunter is a part of a lot of other sort of higher end players are a part of uh but it's very new friendly too we weren't all higher players i mean that's where I've spent most of my time. That's basically where I learned how to play Nebulous. There's a combination of uh, help on the main Discord, but a lot of gaming with people on this other Discord that has pings available. It's Darg's Coliseum, although it might have a weird name. We've been 
messing around and giving it different names just to be silly lately. And the link for that's going to be in the description as well. Feel free to come on down, ask questions. Uh, there are a lot fewer people there than I, on the official server. And so if you're... A lot of folks are down with the way the official server is. I know I certainly am. I really enjoy it. But for some people, it's a little too hectic and busy. And if you don't want to deal with that, if you're if you're a little... Uh, I don't want to use the word socially inept or socially awkward, but that's kind of what I'm reaching for here. Um, the Coliseum has a lot fewer people in it. So you can get some help there. Mm, bum, bum, bum. Is it? That's all. Oh, this was on reminder. Very important reminder. This was all done on the testing branch. Some of this at the time of uploading. The core principles in those uh, on those ships on the ANS side are the same, but not on the OSP side. So there, there's some tweaks and some adjustments, especially for the monitor. And so th some of these ideas won't apply to the current live version of the game. But I'm imagining here in about a month that videos, it, all those things are going to be applicable to live. All the, all the ideas, the exact numbers might not be the exact same, but the ideas are going to be the same. And that'll future-proof it a little bit, at least until the next big change. I hope that helps. I wish you a good day, dear viewer. <laughs>